I always wonder when the porn when the porn ad is going to come. That's when we know the show has really started. Is when the the uh, Tinder the special Tinder ad thing comes for getting sexes off of the internet. Yes. Okay. Um, today is going to be a, a participation episode, but, but while we're doing this, we're going to do, we're going to do personal balance sheet today. Um, and while we do that, we are not going to be sharing the numbers with anybody. This is just for you, but it's something that most people do. And it's odd that people like get out of school and they don't understand their own balance sheet. So we're going to mess with that today because I actually talked to somebody. <laughs> I talked to a banker friend of mine. He's someone I had tried to get into crypto years ago and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he he is at a pretty decent sized bank and he doesn't even know what his own personal balance sheet looks like, like his family balance sheet. So we're going to do that today. So we'll just we're not going to spend too much time on markets because kind of who cares? You know where you're at. We're we're investing right now. If you're if you're comfortable investing, you're in your dollar cost averaging into assets that you like. If you watched the show that Adam and I did Monday, you understand that what our well my thesis and I think Adam kind of agrees that crypto is not dead. We're going to get back to those November highs, September November highs again at some point over the next 16 18 months, and it might make sense to lock in like a five to seven x. Maybe if you're into that, let me say hello to Sniper Princess, Hootie, Joe Pirate, Biotech Breakout, CC Brown, Jim Ham, Gordon Bennett, Pseudonomia, Pseudonomia. I like that. It's kind of like the state of pseudon pseudon pseudonymity, 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 anemone, see him anemone. If you say see anemone like 45 times, you your mouth just quits understanding what your brain is saying. So, minute, minute, minute. Smini mini mini. Uh arm D NFT Nifty. Arm to Nifty. What's up? Okay. Um, for those of you wondering, I sh I should disclose. So I'm I'm consulting on a project right now, the Lost Club Toys. It's super cool. Um full disclosure, it's an NFT project, and most NFT stuff is degenerate. But this one in particular I like because it's about music. And I'm like into EDM and stuff. I used to live in Ibiza and all that. So it's a cool, it's a cool project where you have like a little fluffy, like dancing NFT dude. But the the different pieces have music bites attached to them and they're all unique. And you can combine them and make music. And like they're gonna do these spinning sessions with big DJs where they'll come in and use different people's um, NFT like mute sound bites. And if your music gets produced, like if your little sound piece gets produced and goes like Sanchez or, or Tiesto does a track with, with your piece or several pieces, you get a percentage of the royalty. So it's kind of like collab to earn and you can like create music. It's also about like teaching like people how to spin and how to create music and produce and all this kind of stuff. Anyway, it's cool. Should you buy it? No, you shouldn't buy anything ever. I'm going to, but you shouldn't. There, there's your full, there's your full disclaimer. Um, who day? What's up? Okay, Cisco. What's going on, Cisco? Ba, 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 ba. Cisco was the first one in the hopper this morning. Dan, what up, Dan? Nara, Costas. There's no such thing as S coins, Costas. Costas. There are only it's Bitcoin and alternative assets. If you start buying into that maxi stuff where you say S coins. You dumb. Don't do it. Don't buy into that crap. Don't buy into any of the maxi logic. It's all wrong. No matter what, no matter what the maximalist shill angle is, it's wrong. There's no such thing as maximalism in disintermediated systems. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> like, listen, listen to what you're saying and look at the space that you're in. I am a decentralization maximalist. What? <laughs> that doesn't make sense. Um, um, how would one go? Oh, Hootie. So 
um, go to Lost. For those of you who want to take a look, I like it. If you go on the website to Lost Club Toys, just like it sounds, lostclubtoys.com, just go through the different fluffy characters. There's like eight of them, and they all have like little beats, and you'll kind of get the idea like, okay, this is like a 15 or 20-second little beat. And you could start to see how those beats could be combined to make music or like part of a music. I don't, you'll get it, right? And then they're doing different things. They're also – they're rendered dope. Like the guys that are working on it, these are like, like top skill, like devs and stuff like that. They're not, it's not like some, it's not like some creep team. That's like, I have a pen and now I have NFTs. No, like these dudes are like, they're really talented. They're, they're like fashion designers and stuff like that. They're not like, not like me. They're not mindless rubes. All right. Um, so they're pretty dope. And this, the new net snapshot is ongoing for the entire month. And then in July is when Inara will get us closer to that. But that's um, – leave your, your AGIX alone. Don't, don't move it. Don't do nothing right now. Just leave it alone. And then we'll have a registration period in July, and you'll, you'll register uh, to, to get the new net token airdrop. And everybody's like, oh, man, it's so cheap. It's a, it's a, listen, if you missed new net, it's now below the original offer price. Now, what did you miss if you didn't get it? Well, you you haven't been staking, you haven't been collecting rewards, but you you don't feel, you shouldn't feel like you missed anything. Everybody in the world got like a like a one year reset. People are so flipping lucky right now; they don't get it. But anyway, yeah, enough about that. Uh, let me say hello to everyone. Bitcoin Candy, what's going on, Todd? Hello, P. Kelly in the house. Johnny Minus, where are we at today? You're in West Hollywood. What? What? Um. You get some. Uh, were you getting some some lightning and some cool kind of thundery stuff going on today? I, this morning I was at the gym, leg day, and it was like oh, 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 that was badass. Crypto fanatico, what's up? Que onda, Joe? Espero que todo esté bien para ti, su familia también. Nico, Debbie, Florida Dan, that video was insane. Only Dan and I will share this knowledge. That was crazy. Uh, bon, I actually, Bon Colones, I agree with you. Namasteo, Joe Pirate, what's going on? Yes, uh, CBDCs are coming to a to a government near you. Sarah, what up? Uh, bad hat, first hat. Welcome to welcome to the first half of the rest of your day. Well, it wouldn't be your day would only be two hours, then wouldn't it? Nick, what's going on? Ella Paul, Crypto Amigos, Jungle in the house. What up, Jungle? We were actually talking a little bit this morning, Jungle and I going back and forth about what a what what it looks like Celsius, like the unwind looks like. I don't know. Maybe they'll get bailed out. I hope not. I hope that whoever's working behind the scenes to help them make their investors good is also making sure that they don't exist because Celsius is bad in the same way that USDT is bad, that Luna was bad, that Galaxy Digital is bad. That you know that Binance is bad. That unfortunately Gemini is bad. These guys are all running chop shops. Just they're all running chop shops. That is, it is what it is. You can get emotional, and you can. These guys are running chop shops. You invest in them, you get what you get. It is unfortunate that people like them so much. They get caught up in the, in the, the mystique and the delirium of these of these guys, and that's no bueno. Tiffany. And like I get, I get why people become Bitcoin maxis because when you look at the, at the rest of the space, there's so many sketchy projects. But you know what? There's sketchy projects that are Bitcoin related. Many, these little, come on, Swan, Bitcoin, all this stuff. We'll help you buy Bitcoin. You don't need help buying Bitcoin. You got Coinbase. Buy Bitcoin. Move it to wallet. Done. What do you need help? We'll help you take your for a fee. We'll help you take – listen, anybody want me want me to help you buy Bitcoin? Awesome. For a fee, I'll tell you – I'll tell you right here. You can either pay me to do it or we'll do it for free. Ready? Buy Bitcoin on Coinbase. Transfer it to a private wallet. And fee. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. You've now participated in Swan Bitcoin. And it's fine. Look. I get it. It's a hand-holding service, but come the F on. You don't need a hand-holding service, bro. Common sense. You guys can buy Bitcoin. You can buy whatever the F you want. You don't need someone to hold your hand. Like, again, disintermediation. 
and I, I don't I don't usually say decentralization. None of these platforms are really decentralized. Decentralization doesn't really full decentralization. No disintermediation. Awesome. Removing rent takers. Sweet. Decentralization. Mostly a fail. Why? Because people can't govern themselves. It's the same. We I was talking to Sarah about this difference between democracy and a republic. And we share the same ideas that like a true democracy is two wolves and a lamb voting on dinner. Uh, come on, man. Or, or a hiker and two cannibals voting on what's for dinner. Like common sense, right? What, what, what did Winston Churchill say? If you want to know the limits of democracy, spend five minutes with the aggregate voter or something. And Churchill was a dick, but he, he, he had some clever he was wit he's quite witty. He's quite a witty dick. Anyway, Demayan, Amy, Kenneth, Grace, Adam. What up, Adam? Um, I am curious, gosh, because it was right after we spoke when they did the um when they pushed back the Vassal Hard Fork. And by the way, they're rolling it out. The test, the test net is happening, the, the upgraded test net. It's not the hard fork is not rolling out publicly until about four weeks after. And although they didn't say, they, they kind of beat around the bush, I think it's because they couldn't get all the exchanges on board because the exchanges have been overloaded with traffic. They got their own problems. That Cloudflare incident um, a day or two ago, that was, was it yesterday or Monday? Well, there was a Cloudflare, inst uh, Cloudflare issue where uh, they were having trouble aggregating data, pricing data and things like this. So, that was that it wasn't the exchanges were breaking, but the exchanges have had some hardships in these kind of weirdness times. So don't, I think what they did was smart. I mean, Ethereum ain't any, any closer to, to doing their, you know, to, to, to doing the merge. The merge won't really solve anything anyway, but it's just like another step. So I would always say, wait, slow down. Um, but anyway, so they will be rolling out the upgrades. If, if I have this correct, Adam, and you can, and you can correct me. They will be rolling out the hard the upgrades to the test net where developers will start banging around with it. They'll have four weeks to bang around with it, and then they'll roll it out to us. But my guess is it was the exchanges that were the problem. It wasn't necessarily the, the code itself. We'll see. Uh, Dave, what's going on? Dan, I just made some, some beats yesterday. Just made some beats yesterday. I know. Dude, Lost Club Toys is dope. Um, I, I, I've spent some time. I don't, you know, I don't consult on these things because most of them are garbage. I get, I mean, no, no BS. I get like two to three emails. Uh, I get like two emails a day. Some just from these weird projects that are like, talk about us on your thing and we'll give you $1,736 all this kind of crap. I'm like, no, man, I ain't going to jail for you creeps. But it, with the lost club toys, Josh introduced me to Daniel and introduced me to the team. They get a really smart team, and um, they're and they're actual artists. Like they were showing me, they were in, they're in Berlin. They were showing me all this cool like clothing and stuff. I don't know dick about clothing, but I know that they know more than I do. And I was like, man, those some cool threads, bro. Anyway, so that's why I'm that's why I'm part of it, and I'm not being paid anything. They give me no money. Um, I do think I get some NFTs out of it though. I get some dance and bears. To buy money, what's up? Cisco, Simon, uh, after sunny, are you guys sunny there? Nice. Bottom of the afternoon to you? Top of the, mm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the uh, colloquialisms are. JJ, what up? Uh, big currency unit max. We're wealth maximalists, but wealth is uh, kind of an inde indefinable, uh, undefinable thing. Benny Ben, caffeine maximalist. You know what I just had? If anybody, this is not an ad because Starbucks doesn't give a crap about me, but they have a cold chocolate, cold foam, chocolate foam, cold brew. It's one of those four words jammed together. Chocolate, cold foam, cold brew, or chocolate foam, cold. Man, it's like if you took the baby Jesus and slid its neck open and just drank the blood from the neck of the baby Jesus, it's that good. Good as hell. Costas, since you uh, since you still attract maxis, you show it means that you're on the road. Maybe I look look, man. I um, it's funny. Uh, 
so you, you guys know that Jeff, uh, Jeff Snyder, myself, Emil, we have a we have a real cool relationship. We chat a lot and things like that. And occasionally I get to go on their show and act like I know stuff. Um, but mostly they know stuff. But the one thing that is, is I never completely bought into any one specific project in crypto. Woodgrain, what's up? Namaste, what's up? Frank W., what's up? I never, I never bought into crypto the way a lot of people did. Maybe because I came from gold, maybe because whatever. Now, as far as from a wealth maximization, maximization perspective, there's nowhere else. There's nowhere else where you're going to see these kinds of returns. There's also nowhere else where you're going to see this kind of risk. Right? So just, just understand that with, with great risk comes great reward. It's not so easy, crypto. And the, and the reason it's not so easy is because there's a lot of factors involved. One of them is one that we're going to discuss today, which is your, your personal balance sheet. I can show that up there. Um, and as we go through our personal balance sheet, um, we're going to explain what these things are. Um, because you, this is where you start before you invest. If you don't have your house in order, man, you can't be investing in nothing. You need You should be on the sidelines. You have to know... You have to know what you're buying and you have to know how much money you have and you have to know what is a safe kind of financially responsible way to move forward. Now, I have some different theories on stuff than other people do. Like I tend to believe that credit cards when used judiciously are good, not for investment, but just in life for business expansion, things like that. Credit is important. We're not going to get into the nuances of credit and credit availability, but Gordon Bennett, what's up, man? Uh, Wed8008, what's up? But we we it, we may hint around the issue. Um, and Adam, no. There are no S-coins because they're not S-coins to everyone. And when you you just can't go down that path of labeling, of, of just blanket labeling. There are definitely crappy people. Like the guys at Hex, the guys at Solana, the guys at Luna. The, the people are garbage. There's not – the coin is not – the coin is not evil. The technology is not evil. It may be it may be weak code, but it's not it's not it's not weak electron. How dare you be an electron, stupid, stupid electrons in your permissible in your semi permissible system? The weakness is people. The weakness in Solana right now is the people. The team is weak. The tech is weak as a result of the people. I'm sure that there are versions of proof of history that that would make sense for some kind of consensus mechanism, but they, the team at Solana, they just went full, full tard, full crypt hard of speed. They didn't care about anything else. And when they made that decision, they made some huge trade-offs that you just can't make. There are just trade-offs. There are just trade-offs in crypto that you can't make that you, you can't, there are certain things you need to maintain a network. They just chose not to that's, that's on them. Right, like you can't have total uptime or liveness, and 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 just massive uh, security and massive scalability and massive uh, transaction throughput. You can't have all of those to a hundred percent. There's only like a hundred percent to give. They became maximalists. Well, they were VC maximalists, weren't they? They were they were perverted by VCs, but they took something that wasn't ready to launch, and they were pushed into launching it. They did not have the technical background, the academic background. They didn't have the development chops. And this is what you see because crypto is not so easy. It's just not easy. So, but it's not the code's fault. It's weak code because of weak humans. I mean, any of those projects under different leadership, under competent leadership may have value. Just be careful. I think it's it's dangerous to label anything. There is no such thing as an S coin. That's just weak. When I hear that, it's like if I'm going out on a date with a girl, she starts cussing a lot. I'm like, eh. I mean, I don't mind it, I guess, but it's weird. There's no other words. You, you know, you can, you can drop an F bomb, but not every every comma should not be replaced by an F bomb. Then you're not really using it judiciously. I don't know. Maybe it's me. Maybe it's me. Oh, there he is. Yes. Now we got our naked, naked thing guy, naked, naked Twittery thing. Let me see if I can block him. Okay. Uh, let me, let me get through this. Oh my God. Did I lose my place? Uh, Ella Paul, Grace, Kenneth, 
Uh, okay, there we I think we're back. But anyway, um, let me go through. Uh, so, Costas, Jose, que onda? Flare is going live. Oh, finally, Jesus. Does that mean we'll get our tokens that are that are hemmed up over it? I liked um, I liked the guys at Flare. I just don't know if they're going to ever get off the ground. But I like them. They're cool dudes. I hope it works. I just don't – I think they're trying to solve too many problems. And I just think – I think it's too many, too much, too mucho. When you're trying to do too mucho, is trouble. Is trouble. Um, Scorpion, you can't, you can't set. Uh, a one, one cannot ride two horses with only one ass. <laughs> it's in it right now. So I know he's such a dummy. Look, the thing is, this is uh, my opinion is that the Fed was right about transitory, but they got they got politicaled into 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 changing their their vernacular, and they're kind of they're they're kind of their through line, their story, there's the story they, they were, but people think transitory means tomorrow. Transitory doesn't mean like the sun revolving, like, like the sun will come up tomorrow. Transitory can be months. Transitory can be a year, a year and a half. If we spent a year and a half in COVID, why do you think that the, the, the unwinding of these supply chain dislocations would, would take three weeks or a month? The, the true, and, and it doesn't take a genius to see, Retailers are are stuck with tons of product. There's tons of product at the ports. This is the other side of that vicious, voracious cycle of supply chain managers. You can't get anything, so you overorder and you overorder and you overorder. And there's a squeeze, and then there's a premium on products because there's the same amount of people. Maybe they even have extra cash or transfer payments, and they're competing to get the same TVs, cars, whatever. And then throw on chip, chip. Uh, shortages, things like this. So what do you have? You have a premium. So that looks like inflation. You have an energy problem. That looks like inflation. Why? Well, if you turn off a bunch of facilities and new facilities are not coming online, you get what you get. But these things work themselves out, either through creative destruction, where they, they just destroy old facilities, build new ones, or through new energy pathways, things like that. If gas prices are always – because people say gas prices are never coming down, Right. It never, never coming down. So you don't think that green energy will ever, it can't be all of these things, right? So, so you have a bunch of supply chain dislocations that lasted for many, many months. As you know, when you, as you may know, when you shut down um, most of these energy facilities, these big facilities, when you shut them down, it takes about a few hours to shut down like a lumber mill. It doesn't take a few hours to turn it back on. It doesn't take a few hours to turn back on an oil refinery. Or a processing facility in 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 outside of Houston, in Galveston, these things take a long time, and it's not so smooth. And when these supply chains get disrupted, it's like in traffic. One dickhead hits the brakes and turns sideways because they're looking at a text, and seventy four thousand people behind them on the four hundred five just lost fifteen minutes to an hour of their of their life because of texting dick bag. Like that's just the way it kind of works. So these dislocations take time and they have weird butterfly effects to the negative. But they also – they do ameliorate themselves. When things get too expensive, people stop buying. When gas gets too expensive, people stop driving. Like when energy – so these things too they, – they, these two shall pass. But that's – this is not inflation, right? If I raise the price of a product, that's not inflation, there are monetary forces. If you have monetary inputs that create a monetary-based inflationary effect, a debasement effect, absolutely. That's inflation. Six eggs, 12 people that want the eggs. The eggs become more expensive for a short amount of time until markets game that out, right? They arbitrage that. So they start producing, they start producing more eggs, more chickens. And then at some point, more eggs come in. And then usually there's too many eggs because people are over-ordering eggs. And then all the eggs show up, and then the price of eggs go back down. And like, well, what happens when inflation is abated? Deflation. Yeah, not exactly. Because the opposite of inflation is not deflation. Same, same word after the prefix, different, different meaning. A lack of inflation is not deflation. So – and again, it's it's people – we all want to kind of simplify things in our mind. It's just not so simple. And this is why, again, we start with the balance sheet, right? We start with the very core, the very basic, most fundamental part of managing your life. 
managing a balance sheet. Simon. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You guys know the rules. We've had 55 people. We have 50, so you have to have at least 27 likes. Or it gets newt. <laughs> Jim, what's up, buddy? Uh, bu -bu 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 Cyan. D's, uh, uh, let's see. What is, oh, BZ, what's going on, man? Anderson class. Yeah, take a seat in the back, sir. Get your pen. <laughs> um, okay, we're going to get through these, and we're going to get the show started. Brian, what's going on? Quit eating baby Jesus. No, I'm not eating him. I'm just suckling the blood out of his neck. Or her. We can't even give Jesus a pronoun. Can you imagine the amount of ass whooping you would receive if you had a pronoun argument with some with some Roman tax collector? Man, they would beat you to a jelly. <laughs> that, that was so good. The leads aren't weak. You're weak. Coffee is for closers. So awesome. <laughs> uh, Steve, what's going on, buddy? Okay, let me, I'm going to get through this. Bunny, what up? Hoop and Tony. Yes, market, yeah, markets find equilibrium because everybody, well, everybody, because participants in a market, intermediaries, and otherwise tend to arbitrate opportunity. So every, all of us here are arbitrating opportunity, right? You're in the crypto space most likely because you look at the value of these things and you, and you, forward, you do some forward pricing in your mind. And after you've done that, that calculation, you think, it's currently at a discount to what the the aggregate investor thinks. Because if it wasn't, it wouldn't be, and you'd be at stasis, right? The price would be the value, and the price would be equal. It's the disparity in value and price that gives you opportunity, and that's a, that's a judgment you make, gaming, perceiving, using critical thinking skills that I hope you developed over a lifetime of nature and nurture and self-evolution. Whew. Oh, yeah, I said it. I said it. Okay, that was such a great, that scene is so awesome. It's just the greatest scene. Anyway, um, Richie C, what's up? All right, let's do this. Uh, let's do our non-commercial, commercial, non-commercial non break. We'll be right back. And then let's learn, um, I don't even really want to spend too much time on the, on the markets. They're just not that interesting. I just don't care. Um, we're going to go right to the balance sheet. How about that? So pen, paper, and not, and not if you're driving. If you're driving, no. This is only for people that are not driving, which means Phil, because Phil always watches this when he's driving. And Phil, we don't want you driving into oncoming traffic. So you can you have permission just to listen. All right, so let me get rid of this banner. Let me. What, what, what kind of? Uh, what do you guys think? What, what's some? Should we go with? Uh, do we want the ducks today? Do we want lo-fi? Do we want info space? Night driving? Rock? Maybe info space? A little background? That'll work. I don't know if you guys can hear it. Oh, also, by the way, for those of you that were saying that there were, it looked like there were problems. The last couple of videos have been kind of it felt like they were sketchy. I had it on HD. The camera was on HD setting. And I'm thinking that was too rich for these broadcasts over these kind of weak ass networks. No, no, no ducks. No ducks, bunny. F the ducks. Uh, Steven asks, how do you think the space will behave under increasing interest rate environment? Will this be the industry's first real test? No, I think it's had a bunch of tests, Steve. Um, I, I got this question yesterday. Somebody texted me, somebody that, you know, they don't, they only ask me questions about crypto once every 17 months when there's a sell off, when everything's going up, they're telling their friends how smart they are. And when everything's going down, their one friend said interest rates. And then they're like, everybody brings out the interest rate thing. Okay. Look, when the fed increases interest rates, that alone is not enough to see if the rest of the world cares. The fed increasing interest rates is there's some portfolio effect to be sure because there's still a lot of people that don't understand that what the Fed does doesn't matter. And if you want to see how much it doesn't matter, go look at the yield curve. 
Go look at the interest rate yield curve. When the Fed raises rates, you would say, well, if they raise rates here, certainly that would be the starting point for the rest of the curve to go up, right? You'd never be, you'd never have money dealers moving moving cash and debt around for less than what the government will offer you. That doesn't even make any sense, right? Well, look at the yield curve. It's inverted AF until you get way out into the bond area. But the bills, 12 months or less, like like literally three or four weeks out, four weeks out on the run is less than the current. And what do you know from that? And not to get into a, a yield curve discussion, but what do you know from what you're seeing? These inversions in the yield curve, these inversions in the euro dollar dollar, these inversions in Fed funds, like from Fed funds to the to the whites, the reds, the you know, as you go through the different uh, the different color, the chromography or the color spectrum of government debt. It's the it's the bond market players, the people that are that have the closest understanding of the monetary inputs in the system, and they are calling the Fed's bluff. They are saying, not only are you guys wrong, you're really wrong, you're near term wrong, and we don't think you're going to continue raising rates into 2023 and 24. Matter of fact, there's a lot of predictability looking in at the bond market that the Fed is done done this year, like done raising rates this year. Because the numbers they're talking about don't make sense. You can't give everyone free money for a decade and and change and then jack rates up up on them. And also you're seeing that money in in many cases is less valuable than collateral. So there's a collateral effect where uh, uh, this kind of crunch, like Jeff Snyder says, this kind of race, a scramble for collateral. And it's a messy scramble for collateral. But sometimes cash money is not as valuable on a balance sheet as cash equivalents that have a very interesting collateral effect. And that collateral can be and is seems to be more valuable on the aggregate than just cash. So when the Fed's like, hey, park your stuff over here. We'll pay you reserves and all that. People are like, nah, brah. Nah, I don't think so. So this is very interesting. Yolo Buck, what's up? So be very careful um, that you don't say because the Fed, because now if we if we back the Fed part of it off and take your question, let's take your question a different way, Steve. Just an, um, and matter of fact, this is this is probably the way you intended it. Tower, what up? Um, if you if you looked at the question like this, what is a higher interest rate environment look like? Just period, and that's kind of more to the to your to your question. A higher interest rate environment would mean that it costs more to service debt. So let's look at housing. Let's game that out. If if servicing the debt on a house is going to be more expensive, if your down payment is going to be more expensive, if if the cost to service that loan over the life of the loan is more expensive, people are less likely to originate new loans. Now, banks, what the Fed does does not directly determine bank lending rates. That's what's happening in the in that treasuries determine that, not the Fed. The Fed has the very short end and goes whoop whoop and everybody else behaves around that. Matter of fact, when the Fed sets a rate, that's not even really the rate. The market determines the rate because they trade around the Fed. These assets, these trade around these assets. It's not what the Fed says goes. It used to be that, but then people were like, "Wait a minute. Why does what the Fed says go?" So that doesn't matter. But So housing should take a hit, but you know what? Housing needs to take a hit. And another thing, the housing market is completely fiction right now, fiction, because you have banks sitting on pre-foreclosures, zombies, remods, mods, where they keep modifying loans, where they're not foreclosing because they don't want to take those assets and have to service those assets. So they'd rather have a person in the house that's not paying rent, but that's at least mowing the yard rather than no one there at all. And now we've got to cover it. Banks and hedge funds, they become the, the, the land barons through hook or crook. They don't want to they don't want to service these assets. So they're modifying loans when people don't pay, and the people are like, yeah, fine, you can modify it all you want. I'm not paying. I ain't paying nothing. They're okay with they would rather have a non-payer in there servicing the property than them having to service it. Plus, foreclosure costs money. Banks are sitting on houses. They are sitting on houses. 
lots. So it's an artificial market. So if you constrain supply and people are exiting the cities, yeah, of course, it's going to look like houses are going straight up. Oh, building is expensive because lumber. Guess what? Lumber's already come back down. Where's the lumber inflation? Bro? Lumber's going to go up forever. Really? Come on. It's already back down to like near pre-COVID levels. Oh, well, um, hmm, that doesn't count. Look at, no, it all counts. It all matters. These dislocations are ameliorating. With the housing thing, that's like the diamond market. It's just a fiction. The housing market is a fiction. So the cure for high prices in most markets is high prices. People just stop spending. Okay, let's look at um, consumers who say high interest rate environment. What about corporations that are right on the line between – their debt is right on the line between junk and, and uh, triple B? I know this is getting into the weeds a little bit, but you look at the triple B. So triple B is the last line of debt um, that is considered investment grade. And then below that, you have junk, but there's a lot of junk. Oh, well, we're supposed to call it high yield because junk implies crap. So we'll call it high yield. High yield, there's five plus trillion dollars gummed up in high yield. It pays a high yield because there's a high chance of insolvency or, or, or a, like, a, like, a, like a, a harsh liquidity event that could end up ruining the company like to bankruptcy or some kind of you know, m and &E prospect or whatever. Um. Sorry, M and A. So anyway, long story short. So let's look at service debt. Okay, well, it, if you borrowed money as a company super cheap, and then you fall on hard times, and interest rates go up, servicing your debt becomes more expensive. You can't borrow money for free and buy your stock and jack the price up, and borrow money for free and buy your stock and jack the price up, and pay all your corporates uh, bonuses because your stock hit a certain point, so now all their stock options are are jelly. You can't do all that. If interest rates actually go up and the cost to borrow is increased and the cost to service debt is increased. So one, you stop borrowing. Two, the cost of servicing old debt that you haven't rolled over and you can't roll that debt over. So companies that were buying their stock are less inclined to do it. There's going to be some downgrades, obviously. You lose that triple B status. Now you have a bunch of pension funds, hedge funds, money markets that legally cannot own your assets. Or they can't own your debt. They can't have exposure to you because you're no longer investment grade. And then you have – so you can see these kind of cascading weird like, like downgrades, liquidations, all this kind of stuff. So that would not look good. So there's a lot of things when, you, when interest rates would really go up. But you also get rid of a lot of bad behavior. So the markets become healthier. If you have a if you have a whole economy that can't sustain above zero interest rates, then you have a lot of malinvestment, bad investment. More, you've crossed into the, the realm of moral hazard and you've lived there. We've lived in a moral hazard environment for a long time. And this is this is not it's the Fed's not doing this because because of what I'm talking about. The Fed's doing this because <laughs> through some fiction, they believe that you can rest inflation by raising interest rates when like as if that's the – it's the same thing as if I'm driving down the highway at 140 miles an hour and you're like, hit the brakes. And I'm like, well, all I can do to slow the speed down is use my blinker. And they're like, what? You're like, yeah, all I have to do is hit my blinker. I'll just signal to the world what I'm going to do. You're like, but how would that slow the velocity? No, it's cool. I'll hit my blinker. They'll think I'm going to slow down, and they'll behave accordingly. That's the Fed. They hit their blinker instead of the brakes. Why? Because there's no brake pedal. The Fed doesn't have a brake pedal. The Fed's not a money dealer, and they don't understand money anyway, and it don't matter. So keep these things in your mind. They're not so simple. There's a lot of things that – so anyway, Steve, that was a long, circuitous answer, but it's important for people to kind of square it away in their mind that in increase – Interest rate environment is not all bad. It's healthy for a lot of reasons. Does that mean people will not have as much extra cash to invest free money? Yes. But if you think a lot of the premium has already come out, like in the crypto space, if a lot of premium has already been carved off the top, then what you're left with is an investment, is a, is a market that's investing on, like I say, protocols 
based on a real legitimate chance that they might reach use utility and adoption and some forward kind of looking we're not looking backwards when markets are going straight up you're looking backwards like man last week it was this last week it was this now you're forward looking again you're looking at developers you're looking at product you're looking at uh github submits and repos and things like that you're looking at you're, you're look you're melt you're looking at melt value right melt value melt value looks good on a lot of these protocols doesn't look good on a lot of the other ones so I think that's a there's a lot more to that question, Steve, and that's a good question. Hopefully that's something that people are going to kind of think about because there's a lot to that. Joe uh, Powell offers his opinion on lots of things, but when asked about other topics, he was like, we're not involved in that process. Yeah, they're not involved in much. Um, and remember, by the Fed's own admission, you just go back to Greenspan. They're not money dealers. They don't understand money. We, however, need to understand money. So let's let's reduce our thinking for a minute. So personal balance sheet. Let me know real quick, Does I know this sounds stupid, most of you don't want to do it, but I want you to actually get a piece of paper and I want you to write this down. By the way, Sky, Sky Lord Death, cool name by the way. Valeria, what's going on? Uh, Carol's Lettuce, no, sorry, Carlos Lettuce. Carlos is like, that's not my name, bro. Carlos Lettuce, Deboog, what's up? Uh, is Voyager getting wrecked? No, Voyager's getting bailed out. Uh, it looks like FTX went in and part of their bailout, uh, it, uh, SL Hines, what's up? Part of their bailout is they're going to end up owning Voyager. Good for Sam. Listen, if Sam, if all Sam does is go in with other people's money, because we know it's not actually his, if he goes in with other people's money and bails out a lot of these bad businesses and owns them and makes them better and just uses it to expand his balance sheet, great, good, get rid of these douchebags. But then I would also ask, like, who's using Voyager? Like, why? Like, you know, there's there's just, you don't need the platform risk. Just, you don't. Okay, all right. So, part of our personal balance sheet, all right? You have a, you have a piece of paper. Now, you can do, the, like, the four boxes. There's all sorts of different ways to do this. I do it just like this. Personal balance sheet, okay? Now, um, as you're doing this, the whole idea is that you just want to get a snapshot of what your life actually looks like. So what is your income? What's a good, give me, give me some ideas for income people. What's, what's a good, not your personal income. Let's just use as an experiment. What's a good aggregate income in America? 4,000 a month. I don't know. That's, that seems like the poverty line, but I don't know. I don't know what the, I don't know what it is. Like what? 50 K a year. Is that, does that seem about right? I don't know. 50 K. So 4K, 4K a month is 48, so should we just say 4K? So what's our income? Let's do a monthly. Let's call it 4,000. That sound fair? Sam Nukes and Sam Buys, yeah? Yeah, I think there's a good chance that Sam, is, and not Sam's not the only one. These things are never done in a vacuum, but I'm sure he kind of participated in the uh, in the debacle uh, that, that, that pushed... BTC. Look, it only took one 654 Bitcoin sale to nuke this market. See, liquid markets. Okay, so uh, our income is, in this case, let's call it 4K. All right, so what are our expenses? So think about what your expenses are. Um, you have your housing. You have, you have debt service. Um, you have um, electricity. You have your car payments. You have all these things. So in this case, probably the average American, I mean, you guys could look this up. You could Google it. What's the what's the average American expenses per month? Well, here. Don't take my word for it. Let's see. Average American expenses per month. Let's see what the uh the Brave says. Household expense Jesus. 5,111. Well, that's not going to work out. But let's use that. So we're going to we're going to adjust our income accordingly. God, that's the average. Oof. Let's just call it 5,000 crap. That's just depressing. Well, no, we looked it up. Let's let's use it. Okay, so that's oh, frightfully that's that's the average expenses. We're going to have to up our income. Jesus. Okay, well, let's go see what they say is the average American 
income. And obviously, this is going to change depending on where you live, right? Um, a median weekly income of 1037 Crap. How is anybody not bankrupt? In December, now it's 2017. That's, those numbers are going to go up. For 2022, God, these are the 2022 numbers. Annual earnings are 41K. Personal pre personal income of 1037 Oh, that, that paints a nasty picture. So if it's weekly of 1037 that's like 4100 41 what? 4140? Uh. Well, that's not good. You know, I probably should have I should have looked at these numbers first. Yeesh. <sighs> okay, well, <laughs> in this case, the the math is uh un unfortunately pretty clear. Um I mean, let's let's just keep these as whole numbers so that it's not so depressing. God, this is, we'll just make this 5,100. 41. 100. Okay, so just just at this point, you're you're going into debt, right? You guys see that, right? We're negative a thousand a month. You'd be negative. You'd be negative twelve thousand dollars a year. You'd be you'd be gutted. God, that's depressing. Um, it's according to the BLS survey, based on the data, fifty eight fifty four a month went toward bills and expenses. So they have a higher number. The average household earned eighty four three. Okay, and spent seventy. God, that doesn't leave much. But this is part of the thought experiment. For the sake of this. I'm going to I'm going to make this I'm going to make these two equal. And the only reason I'm going to do that is because going any deeper is kind of depressing. But you have to do this for your number. So, I want you to look at your income and be honest. Look at your income and write it on the income section. Again, four corners. Income, expenses, assets, liabilities. Income, X amount. Again, it doesn't matter what that amount is because this is all the cool thing is once you know where you're at, don't don't shy away from this. Know where you're at. And then you can move accordingly around. I did this many years ago and I was, and someone, they just draw, they would draw an X and they would say, okay, you have more expenses. I was like, what do you mean? Well, there's also expenses in servicing your assets. If your assets have to be serviced, they're liabilities. People say, I own a car. Oh, you own a car because you own a car. So you're awesome because you own a car. Okay. Well, is that an asset? It could be. But let's talk about assets. Most people consider a house an asset, a car an asset. What are some other assets? Give me some. Give me some other assets. Rental property, right? There's a difference in these. It's not so. It's not quite so simple. Um, let me do this. Let me make, let me put these. Isn't this fun? We're having fun. We're having fun. Okay, house, car, rental property. Give me some other. Give me some other stocks. Yes, you got some dividends coming, right? A stock could be looked at as essentially you're paying for all of the dividends that might come through the life of the stock, right? That's kind of cool. Remember, uh, owning stock, uh, you first claim on dividends, last claim on liquidation. Okay, so. Dividends, which there's some tax implications, but forget that for now. Um, okay, so let's look at these. Uh, what are some other good ones? Uh, cash is an asset. Yes, absolutely. Cash. Uh, let's just say investments. Mm. Investments, other. Okay, and that would and that would cover other kind of investment stuff, um, which rental property. The problem is rental property, depending on how you're structured. So now, so now let's look over here and let's say, okay, of these, what are liabilities? If you're renting your house, cool. Awesome. If you're not, if you're not renting your house out, it's not an asset because you have to service it. Right. And so then what you do is draw a little line. Uh-oh. 
the servicing of this house, the roof, the yard, the pool, the mo the people that mow, or or you do, which is lost time. You could equate that to expense, but a house is more often than not, if you're being honest with yourself, a house is a liability. Your car is a liability, unless you rent it out. I rent my cars out, but not all of them. I have one daily driver. Now that one car out of the mini is a liability. I trade that for the utility it gives me. There's, there's, there's trade-offs. This isn't like, you don't have to convert your whole life to income and liabilities. I mean, income and, and assets. That's not what the point is. The point is to know where you're at, okay? Rental property, as long as you're making money, is an, is an asset, but you have to look at debt service and the, and the cost of servicing that, that property. And sometimes when that property no longer becomes, it no longer becomes an asset, it becomes more of a liability, especially when you have times like these where governors and stuff are saying don't pay rent. Um, stock. There's a tax liability against the earnings, but it's an asset. Cash is an asset, but it's a but it's an asset through debasement that's depreciating. Your buying power is reduced. And on a bank balance sheet, cash is a liability, right? Because they owe against that. So these things are different for a bank. We're, we're not thinking in terms of banks, although you are your own bank. So cash, cash for the sake of cash. It's losing buying power. Guess what? Cash held long term becomes a lying a liability. And you say, no, it doesn't. That's ridiculous. It does in the sense that that cash could be utilized either to invest or to at least stave off the the effects of debasement, right? To protect yourself from whatever you believe inflation is, however you define that. Okay, so be careful that cash is not considered cash sitting dormant, a dormant idle asset inert is not an asset anymore because you're losing to deflation effects and to whatever whatever you equate inflation to. Let's say it's let's say it is the feds. Did you guys know this? 2% inflation if right? If there's only and I, let's let's consider this as a monetary inflation, 2% more currency units in the system. Every 20 years, your buying power is cut in half. So you tell me, is something that loses 50% of its value every 20 years, is that an asset or is that a liability? I always think about cash as if it's a hot potato, as if cash is on fire. Cash on fire, I don't want it in my hands. Ah, diamonds. Diamonds are tricky. I, that's that's part of that investment's other. Diamonds are not really an investment. It's an artificial, it's a fictitious market. You got to be careful. Same thing with NFTs. You got to be careful. You have to have a fool to buy from you. Artwork, you have to have a greater fool. These things are all very, very, very dangerous kind of suspect markets. Just be very careful that you don't, you don't like necessarily buy into the idea that these are assets. Um, because... You can't get liquid. If, let's let's assume this for the sake of assets, their liquidity is important. Okay, their liquidity is important. Uh, crypto used to be an asset, now liability. Well, you know, it's it's definitely. I think it's a risk asset, and there may be a subset under assets for risk assets that are cyclically valuable, but. And, and, and long-term valuable, I mean, I've made a lot of currency unit equivalent through structured investment in crypto, certainly a lot more than I made in the gold business, but which is why I'm here in crypto. If there's another better market, I'll go to that one, and that's what we'll talk about all day on, this, on these shows. Okay, um, so looking at this, so let's keep it simple. We're, we're looking at our balance sheet, <laughs> your wife. Your wife is, we should all say it's it's an incredible asset. That's... I think that's as far as we should go with that. Um, earning assets versus upkeep assets, right? But Sarah, an upkeep asset's not an asset. If you have to service it, that's a liability. And that's what I'm trying to get at is that a lot of times people believe that an asset that like, again, a car, a house, that these are assets. They're not really, right? Um, 
they can have an asset like function, but if they cost you money, if there's an expense against it, it's a liability of, of, of some, of some degree. It's important to do this because a lot of times we misassume things on our, this, our personal balance sheet. We assume that they are assets. We, and, and we go, listen, I, I make this income. I own these things. No, you own these things that you have to service. Did you guys know that in America, and you can look this up, if you make $250,000 a year, which I think that's pretty good, right? In LA, it's not good. But anywhere else, that's like good. That's like decent money, right? One in three people that make $250,000 a year live paycheck to paycheck. Why? Because when income goes up, people scale their lives outward. Unfortunately, as income goes up, let me get my little pen. Let's go, what color are we gonna use? Let's go with red because this is a red thing. <laughs> I, I assure you. As income goes up, people raise their expenses. So as income goes up, expenses go up. They scale proportionately. Why? Because we got to show everyone that we're making it, that we're getting it done. Oh, here, uh, it's a Tinder guy. God dang, you're so clever. This guy, he's a beast. All right, monetize your wife. <laughs> Unless she's setting up an OnlyFans, I don't know. I don't know if you want to be the guy to pitch that. Um. So, this is the problem: is that people scale. As their income increases, they they proportionally ex they increase their expenses. What they don't do is they don't increase their assets because they end up buying the kind of things which are liabilities, right? Now, hopefully, they're scaling these kinds of things, investments, uh, ca cash maybe, have a little stockpile, have a safety net. Stocks, depending on, that gets into, like we're not talking about investing or how you invest. We're just talking about on your balance sheet. But what do we also know? That houses in most cases are a liability. That cars in most cases, I don't know if you guys are all renting your cars out. Those are definitely liabilities. Rental property, it can be, but, but lately, if you look at markets, rental property has been more of a liability. Cash, if you believe the inflation stuff and you believe we're in a period of some kind of debasement, then cash is a liability because you worked, you traded your hours, you got paid X amount. A few years later, like at the numbers now, 8 7%, it's like six years. Six years and your money has lost half its value. Six, that's not that long, that's 72 months, bro. So think about that. So of your perceived assets, your house, your car, potentially your rental property, and your cash are liabilities because you have to service them. So it's not so simple, right? The assets column is much smaller. So what I urge everyone to do, please take a little bit of time Today, uh, would non-paying dividend stocks be considered a liability or an asset? It's an inner asset. It's a non-productive asset, unfortunately. Um, it's a non-productive asset, and then it becomes – it's it's a gamble. And listen, I would not put <laughs> gambling – anything that, that can fit under, under the term gambling, it's only an asset till it's not. If you start losing money, it's not an asset. It's It's become – you know, a liability, there's there's this cognitive liability in that the money could be put in better places. Now that gets into a long wind. That's what we always talk about is like how to be a competent investor. We're not really, I don't want to talk about opportunity cost, right? That is lost by being in bad investments because that's an opportunity cost, hopefully on the asset side. Now it's not a liability unless you consider cognitively, Adam, could I put the money? Can I put the money 
not could I have, can I put the money in a place where it becomes either a dividend paying asset or a, a gambling asset like like other investments, but where I think there's a potential, I think there's a value mismatch. Because if you buy stock at 20 bucks and it goes to 10 bucks, it's not, it's, there's not an expense. I mean, you could take an expense against it. And, but if it's continuing to diminish in value, at least at that moment, it's a liability. Cause again, at, at X price, you know, if, if the stock is 50 bucks, you traded your life, the hours of your life for your paycheck, which came in the form of income, you minus out. You minus out your expenses. What you had left was what you could spend to add assets. And unfortunately, some of those assets are actually liabilities. And this is really what I wanted to get at today is just being honest with yourself, right? Just be honest with yourself about what your personal balance sheet looks like. You want to fix your life and figure out like what's your cash flow? It's what's left. Your cash flow is what's left to invest in, to invest with. This will determine either how you scale your liabilities or how you scale your assets, right? That's what we talk about 99% of the time. But right now, you guys need to be, and I'm gonna make this cleaner and simpler. Take all these red dots out. No more red dots. Boop. And I'm going to keep it right there. So for those of you that want to give it a little, maybe a little screenshot and practice this, I urge you to do this. Most of you won't, but for the few who do it, it's super, super important in getting your fucking shit together. If you do this, your life will get easier. This one stupid exercise will be more beneficial for you than any of the other shit you ever do, credit, this, that. You don't know where you're going until you know where you are. This is this is how you figure out where you are. I would urge everyone, do this today. Do your personal balance sheet, income, expenses, assets, liabilities, and be honest with yourself. And if you are, you'll know where you stand and you'll know what you need to do. Look, if you say, I'm not making enough money, go look up what the average income is in the job that you do and then go into work and tell those motherfuckers to pay you what the industry standard is. And if they won't, get the fuck out of there, get your resume polished up, fuck off and get a better job. Honestly, this is one of the few times where good employees have, you have gravitas, you have power. If you're not getting paid what you deserve, then you better earn, you better be valuable. Don't be a douchebag and ask for money. Then they'll tell you to F off and there's nowhere to go. But if you deserve it, if you do a good job, go and get your fucking paycheck jacked up. And if they won't do it, go find someone who will. Employers are looking for good people. So go and get your money. That would raise your income. Don't then scale your expenses. Don't be a dumbass. C cut your expenses. How do you want to cut your expenses? Go look at what you think are your assets and the ones that you have to service debt against or that cost money to keep them afloat. Be honest that they're not assets. They are liabilities. Increase your income and decrease your liabilities. This is where you win. You can't do anything on your asset side until you are honest with yourself about what your income truly is. How can you get your expenses down? Right? We want to go down, not up. So decrease your expenses, decrease your liabilities, be honest about your assets, then expand your assets, hopefully with active cash generating, cash flow generating, residual income generating assets, right? Just be honest about what you own. Cool? All right. It is what it is. Sometimes, yeah, this stuff is not super fun, but it's super important. This is the one thing that will make your life easier period just it will i don't know what to tell you you get control of your personal balance sheet and this is a great for those of you with kids and you want to teach them something that they will never 
ever learn in school. I don't, I went through, oh, it doesn't matter. The point is this, this right here, this is what you give your kids. This is what you give yourself. This will change your life. You want to, you want to really do it? Break it down to a day. I allow myself to spend a hundred bucks a day, right? That's all I will spend. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a percentage of what I'm earning. Small percentage, but it's a percentage. I won't let myself spend. I'm, I'm not joking. If I've spent like, if I've, if I spend like 250 bucks on dinner, cause I take some, some person out to dinner and I want to like, Ooh, we're going to go to the firefly or whatever. We spend 250 bucks on dinner. Then I can't spend any money the next day. And I can only spend 50 bucks the day after that because I burnt my hundred bucks. Right, I've already gone into tomorrow. So well, guess what I do? Campbell's thick and chunky, bro. You think I'm lying? I'm not lying. There's people on this stream that have seen my counter. They've seen inside my cupboard. They know. I'm not BSing. I will eat Campbell's thick and chunky and Costco protein sh shakes. It is what it is. So you have to say, so, you, so what this does is you set yourself a daily budget because... You have to be frivolous sometimes. You have to have fun. I'm not telling you to just be miserable. I'm telling you to be fucking honest about it. Because once you're honest about it, I know thick and chunky is so good. Because once you're honest about it, you can improve your balance sheet. And then all of a sudden you find out like, oh man, I can't, I have a little money that I can spend on frivolous stuff. I have some money that I can do kind of cool stick, cool, cool, cool stuff with. I can go to the movies or whatever, but you have to be honest with yourself. And then you know there are times, hey, today I'm eating Campbell's Thick and Chunky because I know this weekend I'm going to go out with my friends and do whatever. I don't drink because that's just like a, that's a, like a huge expense all the time. And it can be a huge liability too. Like if – anyway, that's the whole other thing. But I'm not so frivolous. Um, you guys you, – you be you. And I'm not telling you how to live your life. I'm just telling you you want to understand – what your financial obligations are. And it starts right here. Income expenses, assets, liabilities. All right. On that, um, stay in school. Don't do drugs. Uh, don't do anything. My poor insolvent drunk strung out on meth. Grandmother wouldn't do, as you know, that is very little. I would urge everyone, if you can, share this. This is a pretty kind of non-denominational uh, show. So I would – Share it with people that you think could benefit. Just tell them to spend to the last 15 minutes, 20 minutes, and go learn how to do a personal balance sheet. It will probably help a lot of people. And then guess what? You don't have to do it for them. Unless you want to charge them money. Then in which case, let's say, listen, I'll charge you 1500 bucks. By the way, for those of you who are curious, they, a lot of the these kind of services and stuff, it's 200 bucks, it's 600 bucks, and all that kind of stuff. You guys know I charge 800 bucks an hour, minimum of 40 hours to my clients, minimum to my, like my consulting clients. That's just, that's what I do. That's how I do it. So I'm not, and I'm not telling anybody, I'm not asking, I'm just telling you, you know, if you do something and there's value to it, make sure you're getting paid for it. And you can work on the income side of your, your balance sheet. And if someone's like too expensive, cool, bro, go get someone else. If you're not an expert, rent one. <laughs> and if you are, rent yourself out, bro. And I don't mean OnlyFans. Maybe. But not for me. All right. Um, don't do anything my poor insolvent drunk strong on a meth grandmother wouldn't do. As you know, there's very little. We'll see you later tomorrow and Friday. Um, American Institute for Cryptocurrency Investors through moneymorninglive.com. See you later. Bye. Thank you.